we are going to light a chalice near the beginning of the service. So if you have a candle or a chalice that you want to have nearby, we invite people to light one at home as well. And it's just one of the ways that we're building connection across the miles. It's certainly not necessary. Hey, I see one in Judy's window. And then on the screen, you'll see that there are just ways to connect to Westwood. Westwood is hosting this um, this service in conjunction with Liz James from the UU Hysterical Society. All right, so welcome this morning to Westwood Unitarian. We are so glad that you're here. Now, if you'll all settle in and make yourself comfortable, I think we're going to have a fabulous morning. We start this morning with an opening song. Our musician for today is Carrie Day and we're singing um, a song that's in our hymn book, sing, uh, Singing the Living Tradition, and it's number 389, but you'll see that the words will be on the screen on the slide. So if you wanna stay muted and sing along at home, um, we invite you to join in. Gathered here in the mystery of the hour, gathered here in one strong body, Gathered here in the struggle and the power, spirit draws near of the power. Gathered here in the mystery of the hour, gathered here in the mystery strong body. Gathered here in the struggle and the power, spirit draws near of the power, spirit draws near. It has become quite common in our Canadian traditions, and I see that it's spreading um, through, or Canadian congregations, I see it spreading through American congregations and around the world to begin an event or a service with a land recognition. As we begin, we wish to acknowledge that the land on which the Westwood building is situated is Treaty 6 territory and the traditional meeting ground and home for many Indigenous peoples, including Cree, Soto, Blackfoot, Métis, and Nakota Sioux. And we recognize that many of you here today don't reside in Edmonton, Alberta, or even necessarily in Canada or North America. So we invite you to reflect on the history of your own location, the first people who resided there, and the complex relationships that have continued throughout history wherever you are. As treaty people, we make a commitment to work faithfully to respond to the 94 calls to action that came out of the truth and reconciliation hearings and to learn to be good and responsible neighbors to the people who predate us in this place. Welcome friends from near and far. Welcome to the members and friends of the Unitarian Church of Edmonton, the Westwood Unitarian, the Unitarian Congregation of Saskatoon, and other congregations across the continent and beyond. A special welcome goes out to newcomers who are new to Unitarian Universalist services. We'll explain things as we go along, so it should be really accessible for you. And to the loved ones and old friends that we see zooming in from all around the country. We welcome you, whatever your heritage, whatever your faith, whomever you love, and wherever you may be this morning. My name is Ann Barker. My pronouns are she and her. And I have the honor of being the minister to this Westwood congregation. We have many wonderful volunteers, staff, and musicians who have helped to create this service for you this morning. Most of them are named on the shared screen right now. And there are so many others who work behind the scenes, keeping the wheels turning and the Zoom lights on. Our speaker this morning is Liz James, and we appreciate that she is the reason that many of you put on your best pajamas this morning. I hope that you have a cup of coffee and a comfy couch to settle into because she is going to take you on a beautiful journey that you won't want to miss a moment of. In Unitarian Universalism, the chalice is a symbol of our aspirations representing our highest ideals and our greatest hopes. 
And while I'm the one to speak the chalice lighting words this morning, the power to create meaning is in the hands and the hearts of the people. We are not an authoritative tradition that sends truth from on high, but rather we're an ever evolving community making our own way, discerning and learning as we go. So if you have a candle or a chalice nearby, we light our chalice this morning, holding in our hearts and minds the pressures of the world, the fears and concerns that people carry, the uncertainties of our time, the weight of impending political and cultural unrest, the sorrows and the losses in our lives. And we hold these things gently, wrapped in the understanding that as people of faith, faith in one another, faith in truth and love, that we have strength and power in these moments, that we can shift and change and adapt and help one another to do so as well. May the love of this community help to bring peace into the world. So we've lit our communal chalices this morning in the spirit of peace. And by being here today, you are a member of this community. Now we have a tradition, many congregations do this, but not all of them. We have a tradition of lighting candles of joy and concern. If we were in our church building, we have this beautiful candle tree that's at the front of the room and you can come up and light a candle in silence or share your joys or concerns, or you can just share your joys and concerns if you're not a candle person, um, or you can hold them in your heart. In Zoom world, what we do now is we invite you, if you wish, to type your joys and concerns into the chat and we play a piece of music to accompany us while we do that. And so folks can read along in the chat. We're not going to read them aloud. And this piece of music this morning, uh, our musician Carrie Day, this is one of her originals called Someday. And I think you'll find that after you've heard it and after you've heard Liz speak that these are beautiful companion pieces. All right, let's have the music. <laughs> I let it burn till morning again The little lamp beside the bed Like a beacon or a firefly To light the darkest part of the night I mapped out plans in the ceiling crack Gonna leave this place and never look back Miles beyond this dust bowl city To the countryside all green and pretty Someday, maybe someday Lost their edge, lost their 
the music plays it's one of the few times I get to scroll through and see your faces and it's just so beautiful to see all of the people here gathered together I see colleagues that I've never met colleagues I haven't seen forever people from the hysterical society whose names always pop up and I've never seen them actually breathing out loud and it's just so beautiful to see such a great group of diversity here we light one final candle to represent all the unspoken joys and concerns that we carry in our hearts. And now I invite you to stay muted, but to read the affirmation on the screen with me. May the light of these candles inspire us to use our power to heal and not to harm, to help and not to hinder, to serve the spirit of truth in loving affection and trusting hope. I've known Liz James for nearly 20 years now. We met at church in Saskatoon when we were both fairly new Unitarians. She was the first person to ask me, so when are you gonna go to minister school? A question I answered by bursting into tears. One of my favorites of her many admirable qualities is her willingness not only to make a mistake in public, but her courage to not hide or bury it afterwards. As someone who hosts a group with thousands of participants, she isn't afraid to ask a vulnerable question, to accept criticism with grace, and to leave her lessons hanging out there for just anyone to see. Liz taught me by example, how to be braver, how to take messy chances, and how to loosen the constraints of perfectionism. She'll tell you that she doesn't have a choice, that she couldn't be perfect if she tried. But I promise you that Liz James is a profound cheerleader for the human spirit. I'm so glad that you're going to get a chance to know her a little bit better this morning and that she's willing to share her sometimes tender, sometimes messy, always meaningful story with us today. So now we welcome our guest speaker, my dear friend and partner in UU shenanigans, Liz James. Thanks, Anne. And I want to say thank you to Westwood, too. It means a lot to be asked to come and tell this story. This is a story that is really close to my heart. And it's filled with mistakes. <laughs> when my sister was in grade school, they gave her a desk that didn't fit. I mean, it fit, but it was tight and my sister liked to swing her legs. The teacher ignored her requests for a new desk and my sister came home filled with tears of rage and fury. I was raised in a family that saw itself as heroes of civil disobedience. Looking back, sometimes we really were, sometimes we just didn't want to play, pay movie price for popcorn. I did love the stories of Thoreau and Emerson and the idea of letting my life be a counter friction to stop the machine. That said, in retrospect, it seems a little unfair 
of my parents to send their kids to elementary school passionately declaring the only obligation which I have a right to assume is to do what I think is right, which I bet was not a picnic for the teachers. So my sister arrived at school and took all of her belongings out of her desk and began working on the floor beside it. She calmly informed the teacher that she was on desk strike. I believe he told her to cut it out and then sent her to the principal. I don't remember all the details, but I know that this story went on for several weeks and it involved a lot of drama and it ended with my sister getting a bigger desk. Heroes of civil disobedience we were. I did get 100% on a report on Thoreau in grade seven, but beyond that, my in-depth knowledge of the injustices of the system was surprisingly useless in elementary school. Didn't go over great in seminary either. I arrived in the fall of 2010, fresh faced and eager. They handed me shiny and very expensive looking folders that said transforming lives to transform the world on them. And my first thought was, how do they know we need transforming? How do they know that who we are already isn't worth keeping? Who I was already wasn't turns out very worth keeping, at least not at grad school. I have a brain that is wired with fireworks and it does not sit well within the tight constraints of a desk. Reading long texts is torturous for me. Big words annoy me and make me feel shut out. I'm not good at waiting until the end to ask questions and my questions are often veiled comments. To make matters worse, I was a Canadian doing mostly distance learning at the only UU university that was an option back then. And there I was interacting with big American UUism for the Unitarian Universalism for the first time. On some level, I had always thought my religion was born in my hometown. I thought it arose out of our stories, the story of Anne and Joanna's fight to keep the riverbed safe from developers, the story of Ivan and Judith's baby needing a heart transplant and everybody coming together to pay for flights and long distance phone calls. Or the stories, the national stories, Congregation after congregation collecting boxes of clothing to send to 56 Spark Street in Ottawa for Lada Hichimanova to send overseas. But these were not the correct stories, I learned. Unitarian Universalism wasn't any of those things. Real Unitarian Universalism comes from New England and it is much larger and much more learned and much more institutional than that. Its stories involve Harvard and its music is sung by choirs directed by professionals. It is not nearly so pedestrian as the tiny collection of stories that I held tightly to my chest. I felt like a child returning from an afternoon walk with wet boots to joyfully empty pockets filled with what she had thought were treasures all over a clean carpet. My religion was so much bigger than I'd thought. Big enough to buy shiny folders with fancy logos, not small, not small enough to be cozy, not small enough to change shape to fit me. But the thing is, church doesn't always fit. As I struggled at seminary, I found myself thinking back to my early days as a board member of my home congregation. You know how you find your church and you can't believe how wonderful these people are and you dive in filled with enthusiasm, with joy, and then the first conflict hits and you learn that these people are not as wonderful as you had pictured. These people are the same amount of wonderful as all the other people which translated from metric for you Americans is about 80% as wonderful as your average dog. All this happened before Anne was the minister at Westwood, back when she and I were on the board of my home congregation in Saskatoon. And on those days when my heart was breaking, when we dealt with so conflicts so big that I felt like my church was on fire around me, she and I would cry together. And the thing about church, Anne said, is that the real membership doesn't happen at the beginning. The real membership moment happens when you're fed up. When someone makes a horrible decision or says a horrible thing and everyone just stands there like it was okay. When your heart gets broken and you realize that this is not the place that you thought it was. That moment, Anne explained to me, is your re-membership moment. When you decide if you are really in this. When you decide if this really is your home. And if you're willing to fight for it. And even more than that, if you're willing to be peaceful for it, to listen for it, to love for it, to sit with it while it grows. This isn't what I pictured when I joined, I said, 
It never is, Anne answered. Even if it were, you change, the congregation changes. The question isn't whether it's what you need. The question is whether you are willing to make it what you need. Church life shapes you, sure, but you also shape church. But I'm so angry, I said. Let's find out what's on the other side of that, Anne answered. And I stayed, and I worked it through. And I love what is on the other side of that. It's not that I didn't leave. I did loads of times, but then I turned around and I came back. That's how people fit together. That's what makes it dancing. So I redoubled my efforts to make seminary work. It was at the height of this time that the Lucy Stone Cooperative put a post online linking to applications for a new roommate. <clears throat> the Lucy Stone Cooperative, housing cooperative, represented everything I wished I was a part of. They were one of those unique UU communities, thinking outside the box of ways to live out our religion. I had visited them firsthand and I'd been touched by the warmth and the music and the community. I felt a bit like I did in high school, nose pressed up against the glass, watching what the cool kids were doing. They were big in all the right ways and they were small in all the right ways. And also I was really looking for a way to get out of doing my history homework. <laughs> UU history was turning out to be not quite what I had expected. Reading the words of Michael Servetus, the Unitarian martyr who was burned at the stake hundreds of years ago, was not the experience of inspiration that I was hoping for. Servetus was bright, sure, but he was also entitled and constantly picking fights and so sure of his own wisdom. I still thought it was wrong to burn him, granted, but I could sympathize with the urge. Thoreau, also not the intrepid hero that I had pictured. He lived on land stolen from indigenous peoples and given to him freely for use by Emerson, whose wife did his laundry and often fed him. It's a lot easier to live intentionally and suck the marrow out of life when some woman is doing your laundry for you. But I digress. So one night in the winter of 2015, I joined up with a few others who were also presumably avoiding their homework. And as a prank, we each applied as mostly famous dead Unitarians and Universalists. I applied as Emerson and under pets, I wrote Thoreau. Someone applied as Servetus and under food aversions put barbecue. For balance, we threw in the Holy Spirit and a few others. The application form asked for an email address and we all agreed to put UU Hysterical Society at gmail.com, which was a play on the UU Historical Society. Imagine my surprise when I received a letter inviting us all to attend an upcoming sing-along to get to know prospective housemates and begin the application process. Ever conscious of their commitment to intentional diversity, the Lucy Stone Housing Cooperative members wrote that, as the dead are not a currently protected class, nor one that we have prioritized thus far, I think it's important for you to know that those of you who are no longer living may need to work with the current housemates who may not all have experience or comfort in living with dead bodies. Particularly love that last sentence, may not all have experience in living or may not all have experience or comfort living with dead bodies. Attending an interview would have been tricky as we were neither in Boston nor as deceased as we had claimed. You know how one exaggerates on these applications, but we were not to be outdone. We enlisted the help of an insider and we wrote back the morning after the sing-along claiming that we did attend. Since we were all ghosts, of course, our presence may or may not have been recognized. The Holy Spirit mentioned that this is often a problem at Unitarian Universalist events. We dropped a few details from the sing-along in our note to prove we'd attended. This set off a chain of finger pointing and drama among the housing co-op roommates that we found endlessly funny. When the joke ended though, I realized I hadn't felt so part of my faith in a really long time. The in-jokes and our shared language made terms like corporeal privilege funny, but in a way that alluded to things that we really care about, concepts we're working to normalize. The shared stories of our religious roots, even the shared songs from music night, these things meant as much to me as any of my coursework ever did. The biggest thing though was the values that we embodied. Even as we were in the thick of the prank, we were always really conscious of the fact that a good practical joke should be as funny for the butt of the joke as it is for the pranksters. And we carried that out, enlisting our moles help to know just how far to push things. We showed respect for the inherent mirth and dignity, if you will. I had a revelation after that prank. Religion isn't just about beliefs 
or denominational structures. It's about shared culture, shared stories and music and jokes. And I didn't want that to end. So on a whim, I created a second Facebook group, taking the name from the one that we'd used for our prank coordination. And I named it to the Unitarian Universalist Hysterical Society. I changed the name of the secret one to First UU Universalist Hysterical Society, of course. It grew slowly. I didn't think of it as much of anything at first, except the place where I could go to escape from a formation process that was kind of breaking me. It really was. Everything about what I was trying to become felt wrong to me. The building that my home congregation is now in used to be a United Church, which is like UCC in the States. When we moved in, which was about this time, we knew that one of the first things that we needed to do was deal with the giant cross that loomed over the congregation from the front wall. Like many UU churches, we welcome Christians as members, but we also have Buddhists and atheists and agnostics and pagans. I could go on forever. So it was out of the question to have a giant wooden cross looking at us from the front of the sanctuary. So this idea that the cross had to go was a theologically tidy idea, but it was tricky to carry out in practice. Giant wooden crosses are heavy and unwieldy, and sure you can saw them up in pieces, but if you do that inside, you're gonna get sawdust all over everything. And if you don't saw them up, how are you gonna fit them into the truck to get them to the dump? So maybe you could do it outside on the veto. <laughs> Anne declared to me as I was talking with her about this on the phone. She was far away now. She was a real minister, which is where I think she got this idea that she has this veto power that she was attempting to use. But how are we gonna, I trailed off. I don't know, Anne answered, but figure it out because this church's neighbors all went there before it closed. And this is a very tender time. And the first thing that the UUs do after moving in cannot be sawing up their congregation's cross on the front lawn. So I don't remember how this was resolved, but it was. And the cross came down to the relief of those who didn't wish to gather on Sunday morning under the shadow of a symbol that told only a very partial truth about who we are. Here's the thing though, that cross was on the wall for a lot of years, a lot of very sunny years. And as happens with sunlight, the wall had been lightened over time in every place except the spots where the cross had hung. Of course, it would have been a simple matter to repaint, but to repaint, we would have had to choose colors and to choose colors, we would have had to take into account the chairs that we were gonna replace the pews with. And then we talked to the pew committee and you get where this is going. Many, many months of Sunday services held not under a giant cross so much as under the explicit, conspicuous, and very meaningful shadow cast by that cross's absence. This was a great metaphor, especially since that shadow presided over a gathering of people that had supposedly shed the constraints of their Protestant Christianity roots, yet still gathered on Sunday mornings in a church building for a service with hymns and a sermon presided over by a minister. Now, I wanna be clear, I think this is fine. I love church. I don't want church to change. But I do think it shouldn't be the only way that we do Unitarian Universalism. Seminary was filled with this discussions where we fretted about church crumbling, declining attendance, people disappearing from congregational life. And I kept thinking, well, but where are these people disappearing to? Because they don't cease to exist. They don't stop having the needs that drove them to church in the first place. They're just meeting those needs in different ways. Things needed to change and expand. And the seminarians, they needed change more than anyone. The seminary process works against that though. Formation is hard and it should be, but it's the wrong kind of hard. It's expensive. It produces ministers in tremendous debt. The extensive study work exhausts ministerial candidates and it's hard to be creative and open when you're that exhausted. And all the investment can't help but foster the idea that clergy are special and a bit set apart from those that they serve. And I believe that idea holds us back. But for me, the biggest thing was how hard seminary is on families. I had small children at the time. Seminary and the formation process are coldly impervious to the needs of parents, which means they are coldly impervious to the needs of children. My older preschooler once told my younger preschooler that uni Unitarian Universalism was that thing why mom can't play with us. 
I was training to serve my faith through a process that embodied and supported values that opposed the ones that I believed in. Every time I tried to start a conversation about new ways to do things beyond the church model, someone would say, but how will this pay the salary of ministers, which is a reasonable thing for ministers to ask, particularly if they are in debt, but which is not a great basis for a religion. But then I would think about remembership, about how when something is broken, you don't leave, you stay and you fix it. I would think about my sister and her desk strike, how you can work beside something, even if it doesn't fit you, and how that very act can change things. I would imagine her as a little girl, kneeling beside her desk with her books spread around her, sharpening her pencil to get to work. Men, in the fall of 2015, our congregation did a monthly theme on the topic of honesty. The exercise was to spend a month paying attention to when you were the most and the least honest. At the end of the month, I called my minister, Karen, sobbing and said, I paid attention and every lie I've told has been to protect my ability to be a minister. It was a long pause. I hiccuped. And then I said, wait, I don't mean all ministers are liars. I mean, there's like a professionalism. There's a, an opacity you have to have. You have to be professional. I'm not saying you're a liar. <laughs> Karen did not tell me, <clears throat> did not tell me like many clergy did at the time that my understanding of ministerial authority was a growing edge. She just listened. <clears throat> and I realized I wasn't lying to be a minister exactly. I couldn't think of a single genuine lie I had told, but the times I'd failed to speak up or the times that I hadn't been brave, those times were about fitting into a space that was the wrong place for me. I couldn't deny that the container I'd been trying to fit into was hopelessly broken and that I was breaking myself on the shards of it. I sent in my resignation for ministerial candidacy. I wrote in my journal that I would train to serve my faith in a way that was an embodiment of that faith, that was financially accessible, that was good for my family, that left space for life and experiments. I wrote all these things and then I had to figure out what all of them meant. That winter, I received word that my friend, Reverend Fougence of the Unitarian Church of Burundi had been thrown in prison by his government. There was political unrest there and the Unitarians with their commitment to democracy were becoming less and less safe. I read the email to my partner at the time and when I did, our 12 year old son looked up in horror. But Fougence didn't do anything, Eric said. You know that moment when your kid first realizes how totally unfair this world is? When things are hard, you try to get busy, at least I do. Eric and I jumped into our efforts to help free Fougence. I ran social media stuff, Eric made a website, didn't know he could do that. And we will never know what it was exactly out of the efforts of thousands of UUs from all over the world that earned Fougence his temporary re release, but we do know that it worked. Fougence drove straight to the border to, of Rwanda without so much as saying goodbye to his family. He made it to Canada and then to Saskatoon. He was settling well into his new culture, but of course in North America, he wasn't a minister. The training he needed to get his credentials was way out of his reach. There are grants we can get, Karen told me, but they won't be enough. Do you think you could raise $25,000 using crowdfunding? I had no idea if this was possible. I'd been part of several campaigns by that point that had been a focus of my training, but I'd never run one and I felt completely unqualified. Well, said Anne, who would you say we have to do it that is more qualified? This was a good point. Many of you were a part of that campaign, so you know that we made it. You know the story ends with Fougence fully ordained and his family brought to join him here in Canada. You might not know that the story also ends with me grinning into my computer screen in the gathering evening dusk, thinking that maybe this weird thing I've been trying to do just might have some value. By the fall of 2018, the Hysterical Society group was at 10,000 people. For context, that's about twice as many as there are Unitarians in Canada. I was learning on the job as a moderator about how to run a group, sure, but also about how humor can change lives. I was starting to get notes from people who said that this group gave them what they needed to get through the day. And sometimes these great conversations would pop up in the comments, meaningful ones where we'd really learn from each other. Also, the group was accessible to people who couldn't attend church for whatever reason or weren't ready to. 
and to a whole bunch of these new people who found UUism through us. One guy posted about nearly driving his car off the road when he spotted a UU church yelling, they're real, they're a real religion. He said it was like spotting a unicorn. And I loved this, but it also scared me a little bit. I'd been educated to believe that when people learned about UUism, they should learn about it from somewhere official and tidy. But more than that, I was a little bit haunted by the idea that what we'd built wasn't enough. People were asking to go a little bit deeper and we weren't responding. There was a lost opportunity to meet people's needs. And there was a lost opportunity for an experiment. And experiments are what Tiggers do best. In December of 2018, the UU Hysterical website was launched. There we put some of our funniest and most touching stuff, resources for worship and an online store where we sold cheeky and slightly evangelical stuff like UU indulgences, or for when thoughts and prayers aren't enough stickers, which you can put on all kinds of things, like your fire extinguisher, and then people laugh when they see it, but then when someone knocks over the flaming chalice, they remember where the fire extinguisher is. Much of this stuff I wrote, but a lot of it came from group members too. They had the idea for the weeds or a social construct sticker, which I love, and they made the entire list of committees on the government section of the website. I loved these little products. Things grew steadily and I took this leap of faith and I signed up for a booth at General Assembly, which is the big gathering of UUs in the United States. The booth was expensive and the travel was too, but this was a chance to sell real products, to experiment with new ways of funding UU community. It turned out that the fact that I was a Canadian UU was again, a problem. As I got ready, my accountant informed me in no uncertain terms that I could not physically sell things in the United States. But I had already bought the booth and the products. I had them laid out in these little rows in my living room and I looked at them every day. I was heartbroken that I couldn't get this stuff I loved so much into the hands of people who would use it. And then I decided nobody could stop me. I already had this stuff. What was I gonna do with it? I already had the booth booked. They could stop me from selling the stuff, but they couldn't stop me from giving it away. I posted about this in the group and a wave of support rose to greet me. Donations began pouring in. Hundreds of group members showed up to donate thousands of dollars and they bought out all of my stock. And then they joined me at General Assembly, some of you were there, and we marched in the banner parade. And then I spent three glorious days giving away all this wonderful stuff that I had created. And person after person came up and told me the story of the group's impact on their life. I drove home exhausted and filled with joy. That fall, I was approached by Reverend Fougence, who was now working hard for others from his home community who had fled but were still in refugee camps. He had a group of six and to sponsor them would cost $42,000. I didn't have $42,000. I had spent a lot of money on stickers the previous year, but I did have a 26,000 person group. We sprang into action, creating a line of Christmas products and a donation structure and a campaign. One of my most treasured memories from that Christmas is seeing Eric, the 12 year old, now a man with a booming voice towering over the dining table, diligently gluing glitter and folding things alongside Fougence as we made shipment after shipment of Christmas gifts that joined with the donations to raise more than $18,000 for those refugees. I took shipment after shipment to the post office and eventually the guy asked, so what is the UU Hysterical Society exactly? And I didn't mumble awkwardly or say my usual, I run a group making fun of my own religion, which is not very accurate, but usually ends the conversation. Instead, I spoke clearly and said, we're a humor-based organization that raises money for refugees. And I held my head high as I said this, because now there was no denying that we were a community that changed lives in all kinds of ways. A community that lived our Unitarian principles that puts itself on the line for the worth and dignity of every person. That January, I filed paperwork with the Canadian government to create the not-for-profit Mirth and Dignity. In March, we applied for a grant with the American UU Funding Panel to get funds to expand beyond the Facebook group into a podcast and some worship services and a Patreon community, which we hope will eventually make these things sustainable after the grant time is done. Our podcast is called The Cracked Cup because chalice and coffee. And because as Leonard Cohen sings, 
the cracks are how the light gets in. But also because the cracks are how the light gets out too. I know now that when the cracks form, sometimes you aren't breaking, sometimes you're just growing. Anna and I published the first podcast on Friday and we have been so overwhelmed by the response and the support. I have been especially overwhelmed by this chance to tell our story here at Westwood, which is a congregation that holds a very special place in my heart. I know that the UU Hysterical Society is a strange community, and because of that, what we're doing isn't always recognized as a part of UUism. Even though we are at 55,000 people now, no one outside our group has ever asked us to tell our story of what happened until now. It's not that anyone's trying to exclude us, it's just that people don't know where to put us as a group. And you can't blame them for that. We spent the last five years trying to figure out where to put ourselves. There isn't a more UU story than that, is there? That story of trying to find the right box and failing to be who you're supposed to be, and then to realize the problem isn't that you aren't the right shape. The problem is you need to find the box that fits you, not the other way around. I told Anne proudly that I was gonna conclude with those beautiful words, and she said, why do you need a box anyway? <laughs> These seem like apt words for 2020. This year, when the way we've done things has been turned on its head and we are all experimenting and we are all learning about new ways to connect. When we're realizing that even though it's incredibly hard, we are stronger than we thought we were. Turns out, I'm not the only one who doesn't know where we are or who we are or where we're going. Turns out you don't need to know that. You only need to know who you are traveling with. I am so grateful this morning to be traveling with you. Even if there's no path, even if it's sometimes two steps forward and one step back, even if we are changing direction so often that sometimes it leaves us mildly motion sick. Because it's the stepping and the spinning after all that make it dancing. I hope you will join with me, muted in technology but not in spirit, as we sing Let It Be a Dance together. Let it be a dance we do May I have this dance with you Through the good times and the bad times too Let it be a dance Let a dancing song
I want you all to know that I have saved the chat and I will send it to Liz because she's um, singing and paying attention and probably can't read it. And I want her to hear all the beautiful things or read all the beautiful things that you have shared. And I want you to know that you are always welcome here. One of the great gifts of this time is that um, as a minister, I've been able to go to church in so many places that I can't get to because I'm working on Sunday morning. And so um, I just love that we have visitors here, even if you have other congregations that are your home, you're always welcome here. Unitarian Universalists are a self-funding organization. Our people contribute generously to sustain our ministries and we take weekly connect collections in support of this work. But this week we are going to do something different. This week, we are asking you to make your contribution to Flaming Chalice International. Their web address is on the screen. We'll type it into the chat. That address, if you can't see the screen, is www.flaminginternational.org. And every dollar you give today will be doubled, I said doubled, by the UU funding panel. So please give generously. And now Liz, would you like to say a little more? Those of you who diligently check the math during the sermons, and I know that you are out there, will notice that I said we needed $42,000 for refugees, and then I boasted about how we raised $18,000, which is less than $42,000. Well, the story continued from there. Fulgence went to the UU funding panel, remember them, and told them our story. And they were so inspired that they gave two grants. One was for 9,000 US, You'll have to do your own math here around the currency. The other was a matching grant for 5,000 US, meaning, like Anne said, for every dollar given to the project, they would donate a dollar to match it. So I've been preaching and doing special collections. Fazans has been approaching donors, and we are currently $5,788 Canadian away from filing the paperwork to bring that group of six to their new home. And that's where your support will go this morning. So together, we, um, it is tradition that we sing this little song that you'll see on the screen and the words are written below it. Oh, somebody posted that Reverend Fulgence is speaking at their congregation, Unitarian uh, Church of Montreal, I think that is, um, or Mississauga, that's the other M. Um, this morning, that's really fun. So yeah, Liz is doing this great speaking around the country, around the continent and donating much of what she is paid um, to this charity and we would really love it if you find it in your heart to support it as well. So flaminginternational.org is the address you need. And if you can't remember it, come to the Westwood website or go to the UU Hysterical Society on Facebook and we can remind you where to go. But in the meantime, let's sing one more song together. This is Westwood's choir director, Rebecca Patterson who put together this beautiful little piece. From you I receive, to you I give, together we share, and from this we live, together I receive, to you I give, together I share, and from this we live. So now if you're new, oh, I'm gathering my chalice because we're gonna extinguish our chalices. If you're new and this chalice idea is new to you and you maybe didn't have a chalice handy or a candle or something because it was just a new idea for you. One of the ways our worship committee at Westwood um, lights the chalice wherever we are is we make ourselves into a human chalice. So feel free to be the chalice if you don't have a chalice handy. And uh, we're going to extinguish our chalices now, gently. May the light of self-discovery continue to burn brightly in all of our hearts so that we may always find our paths through the dark times, wherever they lead us, whatever surprises they bring, in pursuit of meaning rich, service strong, and love abundant lives. Thank you so much, Liz, for lighting our hearts on fire this morning. And thank you all for being here. Now, this is the part where people start sneaking away. So hang on and listen to me for one more minute. 
we do have a coffee chat time and you'll get an invitation to join um, a breakout room. If you wanna have a conversation with a smaller group of people and get to know some, you're invited to join that. If you would like to speak to me or to Liz, cause I mean, best pajamas for Liz. If you wanna speak to Liz, just don't accept the invitation to the breakout room and just stay in this center space and we'll manage as best we can as a group in the center. So you have that opportunity to speak with her. On the screen, you'll see um, we advertise next week's service at Westwood is um, Thanksgiving isn't canceled. It may not be in the building. It may not look the same, but Thanksgiving isn't canceled. For you Americans, that's um, real Thanksgiving. And then there's American Thanksgiving in November. Sorry couldn't help it. We usually very politely say that's Canadian Thanksgiving, but you know, we're here. Um, and you'll also see the address on there for the website for the Hysterical Society, the Facebook name of the group, which Liz inconveniently just changed the other day to get lots of attention. And, um, but if you type UU Hysterical Society in Facebook, it will find her. There's almost 56,000 members. It will find her. And our podcast, The Cracked Cup, you can go to your favorite podcast player and type in The Cracked Cup. The the is important. Um, there are other cracked things in there. So The Cracked Cup or go to its website, the cracked um, crackedcuppodcast.com and get it directly. And if you're like me and you needed your kid to teach you how to listen to a podcast, just reach out to one of you. We'll help. We promise. It, don't be... Don't be secretly quiet about it. We'll let you know how to do it. Sorry, but only Canadian sorry just popped up on the chat. I love you all. <laughs>